So I'm gonna uh, move on to our next component and um, this is gonna be our, our patient perspective in preparation for Dr. Nathan Cannell's talk. Um, and uh, as, as we've seen uh, through the um, very uh, perspectives of the physicians today, we've had a geneticist speak to us, we've had a nephrologist speak to us, um, two nephrologists speak to us. It, it's important to recognize that there are uh, multiple physicians from, from different uh, perspectives that are involved. So um, as a lead in here, um, I, I'd ask uh, Emma and Michael and, and Megan just uh, to, to comment briefly on um, the types of doctors. I, I know we've had a, a bit of comment on personality uh, of, of doctors that, you, that you've dealt with, um, but uh, those specialists that, uh, that you were uh, involved with and, and what kind of information you received from them. Um, I, I, as I said previously, I don't know if I'm an AHUS patient or a renal patient, um, and when I've talked to other renal patients, I, I, I don't feel like I fit in anywhere really, and I can't meet other AHUS patients. Um, and so consequently, a lot of people I've seen have been related to my kidney failure or any kind of comorbidities to do with that. Um, so obviously I started off with uh, renal doctors who diagnosed me. Um, the people in intensive care obviously uh, needed to know quite a lot about AHRS. Um, whilst I was in intensive care, I was uh, assessed for a heart transplant, which I couldn't give consent for. Um, when I left uh, intensive care, um, I was referred to a psychiatrist by some people on the ward, the nurses on the ward, uh, because they thought that I was a bit down, and the psychiatrist came to my bed and said, you know, we've heard of it, give it down, and uh, do you want to talk about that? And I was like, well, I just nearly died, and he was like, yeah, fair enough, I think you're probably just, you know, going to cope with that for a little while, um, and that was the last I saw of him. Um, I had uh, uh, problems that, which required a gynecologist um, to, to, to help me with during in, intensive care. Um, I have had uh, polycystic ovaries as a result of the treatment with tamoxifen <coughs> for encapsulating sclerosing peritonitis that requires surgery. Um, I have uh, kind of stuck with cardio cardiology with a, a heart murmur that was diagnosed, or a couple of heart murmurs that was diagnosed uh, about three or four years ago. Um, and I've you know, used the counseling services for a bit of talking therapy at the hospital. Um, so plenty of people just because of the mixture of treatment and um, things that go along with that. Emma, would, would you say that there is a uh, primary physician that, that you see on, on a regular basis or, or is it a smattering of doctors? Um, I see the cardiology team yearly for review, um, but I see for my transplant I've got one consultant that I have to see. I'm not allowed to go and see any of the others, the surgeons or anyone else. I get just one consultant. Got it. Michael? I'll go next, yeah. Um, since I had my correct diagnosis, um, I've been considered relatively stable, but I've had a number of issues along the way. Uh, I've seen more specialists before I was diagnosed, I would say, but uh, since diagnosis, I've counted nine specialists that I've seen. Um, obviously, uh, nephrology and hematology. Um, I just want to make a couple comments about that. My nephri nephrology team has known about my AHS since 2010. They consider my situation from a kidney failure point of view. Understandably, they do not view AHS like a specialist would, so I have asked them to see a hematologist who specializes in TMAs. Fortunately, this specialist has begun working at the hospital I visit. I've had an issue with specialists not working together for many years now and hope this will improve my care by taking a multidisciplinary approach. I have had both my nephrology team and transplant team decide on surgeries without consulting hematology about the AHOS concerns. A specialist in TMAs would keep an eye out for specific blood test results following my, any procedure known to cause a relapse. Marguerite and I have asked for cooperation between teams on a number of occasions when we saw it necessary and they did in the end appreciate that intervention because uh, they saw the necessity of it afterwards. Um, rheumatology I've seen. Um, because of long-term dialysis, I have osteoporosis. Um, 
My, a rheumatologist monitors my bone density, and they've seen it go from normal to osteopenia to now osteoporosis. Uh, dermatology. Um, my dialysis is done overnight while I sleep, so it's eight hours in a row, five times a week. I have catheters in my arm. They have to be well secured to my skin in order for them not to be inadvertently pulled out. Um, this requires substantial taping to my skin for eight hours at a time. I have developed an allergy to the adhesives in the tapes, and despite trying alternatives, I have no choice but to use them. This causes rashes and extreme itchiness, so I needed to see a dermatologist to figure out a way to bring some relief. I was prescribed an ointment eventually to calm the skin ir irritation, and that's helped quite a bit. Uh, neurology number one. <laughs> For short-term memory loss, uh, it's become significant to the point that I have a very noticeable effect on my day-to-day -day living. Um, I was referred to a neurologist for that, and it was diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment, specifically with short-term memory. Neurology number two, um, I've had intermittent vision problems um, ongoing, which no one could explain. Uh, it took a visit to a neurologist to find out that I was experiencing pre-migraine aura called scintillating scotoma from time to time. Uh, I've been to psychiatry. This may predate my AHS diagnosis, but it is ongoing. I have been seeing a psychiatrist for years in order to deal with my mood swings and depression. This has had a huge impact on relationships and everyday life. You have to learn how to deal with people who have no idea what you're going through. Um, transplant since gaining access to eclizumab. I'm now being worked up for a kidney transplant. Because of the AHS complication, I've had three consults with a kidney transplant specialist to this point. And uh, lastly, infectious disease. Um, since last October, I've been having regular fevers of unknown origin, uh, no indication of cause. My nephrologist has referred me to infectious disease specialist, who is also baffled by them. I have had many tests to find a source of infection, including blood cultures, CT scan, gallium scan, transesophageal echocardiogram. At one point, Staphylococcus bacteria were found in two separate blood cultures. So they were treated for, uh, with a four-week regimen of IV antibiotics with the hope that it was wiped out. However, uh, four weeks after that treatment, I had another episode of fever. So it's still not resolved. That's my part. It sounds like they know you on a first name basis. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Megan? Um, I've seen an oncologist. Um, he's sort of my primary care. I see him so often that um, he knows my entire family and I know his entire family. Um, I've seen two different nephrologists. Uh, both were in the hospital um, before my diagnosis. Um, and I think one of them came to visit me a little bit after, but I didn't really meet with them much after that. Um, and uh, a counselor right after I was diagnosed, um, it's pretty difficult to accept your new normal. Yeah. So, and, and much less try to explain your normal to actual normal people. Uh, they don't understand it. You don't look sick, you look totally healthy. Um, so they don't understand how you could be so sick all the time. So other than that, that's all I've seen. And, and it sounds like your oncologist um, takes care of oncologic issues as well as hem hematolo yes. hematology issues. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, well, yeah. Uh, a wide experience, probably more doctors than any of us want to see in, in a lifetime. But uh, it, it is, it's, uh, it's a condition. So, as we see with chronic kidney disease, something that uh, you really have to recognize what, what the new normal is. Um, so again, thank you for those perspectives. Um, Dr. Nathan Cannell is a friend and colleague of mine. He's a hematologist here at the Brigham Women's Hospital. He's the chief of hematology at the Brigham Women's Hospital at, at Faulkner um, Hospital down the street. And uh, he's been kind enough to present um, to us his perspective as a hematologist. Um, as a nephrologist or as a specialist, uh, it is sometimes difficult for us to get out of our specialty and, and interact with um, other groups, and it's absolutely critical um, 
uh, Nathan has, uh, again, been very helpful in that regard. We've uh, dialogued at uh, uh, grand rounds um, or specialty rounds uh, within both the hematology as well as the nephrology specialties, and uh, it's something that continues to be fostered and ho hopefully will continue to grow. And thank you everyone for having me here today. So one of the things that I think is an interesting perspective on the number of, of specialists you've seen is, is this, from a hematology perspective, first I comment that your hematologist is an oncologist. And so um, I think of hematology as a blood specialty, but the vast majority of hematology care in the United States is actually delivered by combined specialists in hematology and oncology. And in fact, my own training uh, was in hematology oncology at Brown University, and I spent a, a significant amount of my time dealing with solid tumor oncology, breast cancer, lung cancer. Um, even though I, I knew very early on that I was not going to be taking care of those uh, particular disorders. And when we look at the way care is delivered in other countries, Canada, for instance, it is a, a straightforward hematology program and training. There is no solid tumor component to it. And so it, there's a lot of work and, and effort being put into in the United States right now. What is the best way to try to deliver complex hematologic care? And you will have people like myself who do just hematology. Um, some of you may have heard of Alice Ma. I think she's down in North Carolina. And she wrote a, a paper for one of the uh, journals recently about what is benign hematology. And she doesn't like the term benign hematologist. We use it, we throw it around, and we use it to try to distinguish ourselves from the people who are doing malignant hematology, leukemia, lymphoma. But when you look at the patients that we're treating, they have very serious and sometimes deadly disorders. And saying that this is a benign condition, well, there's nothing benign about what you've been going through, as we can see from today. And it's hard to also think and go back into our original training. All of us trained initially as internists, uh, in general internal medicine. And so that's why we oftentimes take on these roles of getting involved in other specialties and, and providing some primary care as it's going along. So, so what I, I'm going to hope to do today is provide a little bit of my perspective. Um, my only disclosure is actually that I sit on the board of directors of, this, of the Flanagan Foundation, which is actually a group here in New England that supports patients with leukemia, lymphoma, and those undergoing bone marrow transplant. Back when I thought I was actually gonna be doing that work, um, I became involved with a local group and they've been wonderful to work with. And so I've seen the, the benefit and the power of working with patient advocacy organizations. And so I'm gonna go through what is my perspective. Some of this may seem uh, repetitive to the discussions that were had here earlier today, but this is how we as a hematologist think about these disorders. Earlier this month, or actually earlier this week, I gave a lecture to our own hematology fellows at the Brigham and Dana-Farber where some of these same slides were used. And I wanna say that some of the information I'm trying to present today is very similar to what we try to teach fellows who have heard bits and pieces but need a real in-depth uh, exposure. And so when we think about thrombotic microangiopathy, we think about it being in any one of these realms. And it can be complement mediated, it can be an autoimmune condition like an acquired TTP. Uh, you can have infectious thrombotic microangiopathies. And so this umbrella term of thrombotic microangiopathy came out of the fact that there are so many different disorders that look similar, can sometimes respond to the same treatments, but over years we've started to realize have different pathophysiologies and old names stuck and then new names were formed to try to explain these differences. So what are the ones that we in hematology deal with most frequently? Well, the one that is the thing that keeps us up at night when we're uh, an on-call physician is the call for is this thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Now, this is not an all-inclusive list, but that is the thing that is going to get us into the hospital in the middle of the night because of the severe issue with high mortality if not immediately addressed. And then we start going into these other disorders and TTP and HUS used to be considered on a spectrum, and in many of the literature you'll see it referred to as 
TTPHUS as a single entity and no real recognition or discussion of the fact that these are really two separate disorders because they look so similar in terms of clinical presentations. And then atypical HUS, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about what is in, in this name and why we call it this. It, even though this is what it's called, it's probably not the best name for a disorder. We basically took one disorder, said that you have something different that kind of looks like this, so we'll just give it its same name and move it along. We also worry about things like DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation, a complete imbalance in the coagulation system. We've heard about HELP syndrome, and I also tend to think of the antiphospholipid syndrome as having a lot of overlap. So, as I mentioned, this is what gets us up in the middle of the night, is a page from the emergency department. And so, um, this is uh, based on a case, it's, it's similar in numbers, but uh, details changed a little bit, but uh, as a fellow uh, called in the middle of the night for a 32-year-old woman who's in the emergency department, and so she has a fever, there are marked abnormalities on her CBC, and she has renal dysfunction. And the, the, the physician in the emergency department has already sent off some additional labs, um, and this is pending, and they are calling because they see this smear, then this comment from the technicians in the lab that there are some schistocytes. And their question is almost invariably, is this TTP? And this is what happens when the fellows call me in the middle of the night and they say, I've got a call for a question of TTP. And one of my first things as I'm going through this with them is, okay, let's start thinking about this. But not necessarily, what is this? Is it TTP? But is this a thrombotic microangiopathy, and if so, which one? Because we have to start thinking at the time of presentation about what we're gonna do if we say that we think this is TTP, but as soon as we say that we don't think it's TTP, what is that next step going to be? So I bring up this with, with Shakespeare, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. And this gets to the problem of, of what we call things and what do we do about it. Some of my work is in, in research work is in um, decision analysis and cost-benefit analysis. But at the basis of that are things like anchoring heuristics. When I call another physician and I tell them that I have a case that I think is X, Y, and Z, that I think is TTP, I've already anchored them on that initial diagnosis. And then they start to think of everything in terms of that diagnosis. And it's why it's important to back up and start to consider other things. So this is the paper in 1955 by Conrad Gasser, a pathologist, who um, made the first description in the literature of a hemolytic uremic syndrome. And so uh, I don't read German, but as you can see, it's very easy from the first line to get a sense of what, what he was, was talking about. And this was the, the very first description in 1955. Shortly afterwards in Wales, there was a report of, uh, of an outbreak of uh, cases. Uh, this was in 1966. And I put this up here because I want you to read some of this description. Actually, before we do that, this, I, I'm fascinated by the fact that in 1966, they published a photograph of the peripheral blood smear. And what I would like to show you is, so when we are looking at a blood smear, these are probably white cells, there's no central pallor to it, but this is certainly a red cell, a red blood cell that's supposed to carry oxygen. Actually, there's a white blood cell. This is probably something called a reticulocyte, a baby red blood cell that's come out of the bone marrow. It's much larger than the other red cells. And this is a sign that there is probably peripheral destruction. So after the bone marrow has made the red blood cells, it's going into the blood and something is destroying it the bone marrow is being stimulated to make more red blood cells, and so it puts out these baby red blood cells in response. And then we start to see a cell here that's probably a small piece, another one here. This one looks like a little bit of a helmet. Hematologists love to describe things, and so these cells were given various names, including helmet cells, because they look like a helmet. And so this is you see variation in shapes and size, and we have fancy names, poikilocytosis and isocytosis. But what this is getting at is that there is destruction of red blood cells, and it's, it's, it seems to be mechanical destruction. Mm 
So the, the author said it's evident from the reports that the syndrome presents in two ways, either hemolysis or renal failure being predominant. In cases presenting with renal failure and oliguria, dialysis is imperative and should be carried out with a matter of urgency, and it's reasonable to follow it with steroids. We joke in hematology that if we don't know what's going on, we throw steroids at it, and it oftentimes seems to get better. And um, so many things in hematology respond to steroids. But following this also in the paper, the most common presenting feature was anemia following a diarrheal illness, and all cases were found to have proteinuria and azotemia sometimes of severe degree, but thrombocytopenia described by other authors was not present. So it's interesting. This is a renal predominant disease. There is, there is anemia, but if you notice, there's a diarrheal illness, and it was an outbreak suggesting that there may have been an infectious component to it. So this was the, the way it was described, and HUS was from that point forward described as a disease of childhood with a diarrheal illness. And then in 1965, so this is the, a report of 11 cases, this came out of the Central African Journal of Medicine. And this is where the term atypical HUS comes from. 11 cases of HUS in patients aged five to 36 months. 10 of them followed a similar pattern, diarrhea, acute renal failure, hemolytic anemia with distorted erythrocytes. One case was atypical because there was an antecedent history of upper respiratory infections and recent septic burns to the hands. So that is where the first description of atypical comes from, and the name has stuck since that point. It is not HUS. It is not the same disease. It has very similar components to it, but they are separate illnesses, and we've given it this name, and it has been a bit of an issue with trying to help distinguish this at many cases. So what are we looking for? I mentioned on the smear we're looking for evidence of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. We talk about anemia, just a decreased red cell count is at first. Hemolysis means that the red cell doesn't live its normal 120 day lifespan and is being broken down by some feature. Many times this is due to the own immune system attack of the red blood cells. And so what we're looking for is an elevated LDH, the bilirubin is high, the haptoglobin is low. Haptoglobin is a great test when it's normal because it helps exclude intravascular hemolysis. It only takes about eight milliliters of blood to be broken down in order to completely deplete someone's haptoglobin. It goes up in inflammation. There are tests that look to see if there's antibody on the surface of the red blood cells. TTP and all the thrombotic microangiopathies are by definition a Coombs negative hemolysis. And we're looking at the peripheral blood smear for those features that I mentioned. We're also looking for thrombocytopenia. These are the only two criteria you need to say that somebody has a suspicion of thrombotic microangiopathy. And because we're concerned about something like DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation, we're looking to see are the coagulation studies normal or is there dysregulation in coagulation at a macro level that is leading to the low platelet count. So this is, this is one of my favorite pictures out there. Just blatantly taken from the internet, but this is, gives you an idea of what is going on. You have these fibrils that are being created, and the red cells are going along getting trapped, platelets are getting trapped in it, and, but you have to remember that as these are forming, there are huge areas here, and red cells can pass through there, but as these start to, to close off, the red cells are going at a high rate and get sheared. Um, the way I describe it to the fellows and the residents I work with is think of it like the old spy movies where the, they're running down a hallway and there's a very thin wire across the floor and they fall and trip. Well, the thing is the red blood cells are going so fast and they're actually deformable that the, as they come through, it slices them in, p into pieces and then you start to see the red cell fragments. What does this look like on the peripheral blood smear? Well, this is... Uh, a peripheral blood smear of a patient uh, with, uh, with TTP. Again, a white blood cell here. And we start to see these fragments of red blood cells. These are um, a, a wonderful cell. These are called nucleated red blood cells. These are n never supposed to be out in the periphery of the blood. It indicates that there is something 
so bad that the, red, that the marrow is putting out cells that should be living inside the marrow. So these are the baby red blood cells that are not supposed to have left the nursery yet. The marrow is doing everything it can to correct the anemia. And so this is what we see. And there's one tiny little platelet over here. So this is what we look for. This is characteristic, and th just looking at the peripheral blood smear cannot let you tell the difference between any of these disorders. That's why it can be very frustrating as we try to make a diagnosis. So when we talk about the pathophysiology, there was an observation in the 80s by Joel Moak that this had to do with some issue with von Willebrand factor. When von Willebrand factor levels were tested in patients, you saw these large multimers and they seemed to disappear and then come back. And so there was a hypothesis that it was caused by these high molecular weight multimers of von Willebrand factor, and that these were then trapping platelets and leading to these, uh, this fibrin deposition. So this is what it looks like in a, in a um, uh, multimer analysis at different points. So this is um, a patient who, uh, Actually, so let's start with normal. So this is a normal distribution. So the protein is different lengths depending on how many pieces are put together. Think of them like Legos. They all can be identical, but you can make long strands of them. And so this is what it looks like in normal. This is what it looks like when somebody um, has uh, um, various disorders of thrombotic microangiopathy, but then as they relapse, you start to get these higher molecular weight multimers. And then as they go into remission, you start to see that the pattern starts to look more like normal. So it seemed to be this coming and going of von Willebrand factor. And this was also additional data to support that. And so what you see here is that um, you had patients who were going in and out of remission of their disorder, but there were a whole set of patients who did not have differences in their multimer patterns when they had uh, uh, relapses and, and going into remission. And it turns out that these were the patients that clinically had HUS. And so this was one way to try to start distinguishing them. The problem is multimers take a very long time to get back and you have to make treatment decisions very early on. So this is what it all came down to. So this is the paper in 2002 by Joel Moak, and as you remember, he wrote the paper 20 years prior to this, making this postulation and spent a large portion of his career doing this is that you have this enzyme, Adams TS13, that binds to the endothelium. Von Willebrand factor is secreted from the Weibel Pilate bodies. Everything's named after somebody who discovered it. And so um, as it's being secreted out, the Adams TS13 enzyme comes and chops it into reasonable pieces that can then go off into circulation. The problem is when you have an inhibitor to Adams TS13, either due to an autoimmune condition, or you don't make any Adams CS13. That's congenital TTP, also known as the upshaw shulman syndrome. These long multimers get secreted, and as you can imagine, they sit there and they wave into the blood vessels as these platelets are going by, and they get attached to it. So why is this diagnosis so difficult? And I, I think I'm preaching to the choir a little bit here when I talk about the difficulties that we have. This is something we struggle with when we are trying to make a call in our conferences as to what we're going to be doing next with somebody. So there's a significant overlap of the clinical features and the lab values. There's also a need to treat TTP immediately. Prior to the introduction of therapeutic plasma exchange, 90 to 95 percent of people who were given a diagnosis of TTP died within days to weeks afterwards. Therapeutic plasma exchange changed that so that 80 to 90 percent of people survive. And so when you have a disorder where there is such a, a significant benefit to treatment, the standard becomes to treat everyone who walks through the door with that consideration. Now there have been attempts at trying to say, how can we better classify people? When Adams TS13 came out, um, there were a lot of people who were skeptical as to whether or not you could use these levels. And there's still debate in the literature about using these levels. There have been recently attempts at creating prediction scores. Let's take the labs that look at it. 
And on initial attempt, the, the, one of the recent scores looked very good at excluding people who had TTP so that you would start consideration of other therapies much earlier. And the problem is, is that when this was externally validated at another center, it was found to have 4% of people with TTP being missed just using a scoring system. And so we don't want to say we're going to take the risk of 4% of, of, of people, so 4 out of every 100 people who walk into our center will die because we're not treating them properly. So there's a lot of work still being done out there. There's a lot of clouding of it. So depending on what type of thrombotic microangiopathy is there, if it's a simple lack of having a complement regulatory protein, if you give plasma, that's going to give back that complement regulatory protein. You may see that there is improvement in, in therapy. You give therapeutic plasma exchange and people get better for a period of time. Not everyone does. And then as you withdraw therapy, it starts to become more difficult to maintain the counts. Part of it, what got me into thrombotic microangiopathies at the beginning was looking at this issue of turnaround time. So my own research a couple of years ago before I came up to, to Boston was looking at um, could we bring in the Adams TS13 test and reduce the turnaround time from 9, 10 days down to 24 hours? Would that be helpful? What would it do? And we found that we didn't change mortality at all, but we significantly reduced issues uh, around therapeutic plasma exchange and plasma utilization in the state of Rhode Island, where I was. Um, we also need to think about the turnaround times for genetic testing. And so um, there are attempts being done now at our, in our own center for leukemia patients who need to start therapy immediately. And we have something called a rapid heme panel. And it does next generation sequencing of 95 genes commonly implicated in malignant hematologic disorders. It would be wonderful to have a rapid turnaround test of less than a week to get back all of the genetic testing that you would want. The question that we now run into is what do you do with that information? And the one thing I think we can do a lot of work in is this lack of physician awareness. You can't think of the diagnosis if you've never heard of it before. You can't think of the diagnosis if you haven't been trained to put that into your differential diagnosis for somebody. So this has been put up in various forms uh, throughout the day. And this is what uh, the issue is with uh, atypical HUS. And this is why there are many people who have advocated for calling it complement-mediated thrombotic microangiopathy and coming up with a different acronym and other different things. But a typical HUS is going to stick as a name uh, because of the work. But we're talking about an issue with complement as it comes down into this membrane attack complex. And use of medication, eculizumab is one of them. Uh, there's a, there are trials starting with a modified form of eculizumab, and there are other companies that are looking into upstream complement inhibitors that might be able to do a, a different job or a better job of control and, and put out more therapeutics and more options. So this is a, a paper um, from 2008 that also talks about why is it so difficult to make these diagnoses. When you look at patients who have different mutations, whether it's in complement factor H, factor I, CD46, the membrane cofactor protein, complement factor B or C3 or these antibodies, in most cases, you see that C4 is normal, and then you have variable levels of C3. And this is why these are easy tests for us to get in the hospital, but there are so many things that can affect it. And it would be lovely to have a one-stop shopping test that could tell us what is going on. So this is a paper that came out in 2015 in, in my specialty's journal, Blood. And um, I, I will tell you that I think this is going to be a game changer based on the, the science that's out there. And I cannot wait until this is commercialized and more readily available. So for, since the 1930s, we've had something called the HAM test. And it was designed to try and say, um, if somebody had paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, PNH. And so what ends up happening is you take red cells and you put them in this acidified serum. And 
if there is a lack of CD55 or 59, these are protective proteins on the surface of these red cells, the red cells will lyse. And the ones that have 55 and 59 remain intact. And so this was a disorder that wasn't atypical HUS, but we know that there is a complement component to this. And this is why this was an elegant test in a lateral move. And they took these red cells and um, basically put them into acidified serum, but instead you could have control serum or they took the serum of somebody you suspected have having atypical HUS. And you would see that the serum of patients that have atypical HUS have these complement issues going on and the red cells would lyse and release a dye. It's an easy enough test to do. Ham tests were done for, for decades and then they fell out of favor um, because we had much better tests in order to diagnose PNH. And so now um, Rob Brodsky, who's the chief of hematology at Hopkins, uh, has been looking into this. This was his lab's paper. Um, and we, we talk frequently about trying to send samples down there if there's really a question coming up. Is this TTP? Is this HUS? We usually we are, we're getting better at distinguishing it, but we can, if necessary, try to get them involved. Now, what this is nice is that in patients who have TTP, you see a very low percentage of non-viable cells. But patients, depending on where they are in therapy and in remission, they were very clearly defined as different. And so a patient who had an acute episode was different than TTP. Patients who had atypical HUS and treated with eculizumab still remained different in terms of their response to this test. And even once in remission, there was a difference. So this was a nice test that no matter when it was sent, you could see a difference. You weren't running the issue of missing a diagnosis. Another layer to this was the nice aspect that it could show you response levels. And there was some preliminary data that's being worked on that suggests you might be able to use it for dose titration, determination of frequency of infusion. And in the subset of patients that stop treatment with eculizumab for whatever reason, that you could then monitor them and restart therapy if that, if that was um, starting to act back up again. So that, it is not ready for prime time yet, um, but this test, I think last year they also looked at it and tried to show that it was useful in help. And so it may be one of the first tests that we're going to have to say, is this going to uh, help us in diagnosing the HELP syndrome? So I put this up here. Um, this is a, a very common curve that we look at in all clinical studies. It's something called a Kaplan-Meier curve. So part of my other training and background is, is in epidemiology. And this is called survival analysis. And what you're doing is looking and saying, if everyone, if you start counting, from the time that you make a diagnosis, everybody is alive, so that's at 100%. And then you can choose what you want to be your outcome of interest. So this is called renal survival without end-stage renal disease requiring dialysis. And so kids tend to do bitter, better, but still, this is all pre map data, within about five years, 40% of kids are end up with end-stage renal disease. And you're probably about 50% at 20 years. Adults do much worse. They probably have much more renal reserve and, and ability to tolerate what's going on. This is a, a curve that, these types of curves are generated in every clinical trial and every study that we have. So what do we do for treatment? As soon as this, a thrombotic microangiopathy is suspected, we're getting those COAG studies that I told you the ER had sent. As soon as we see that it's not DIC, we're looking at the blood smear and we see schistocytes. If there's a concern that this is a thrombotic microangiopathy, we're gonna start therapeutic plasma exchange. The goal is to try to start it within 24 hours of time of presentation in an attempt to make sure that we have as good as possible outcomes. And this, if no improvement after several days, this has traditionally been, if there's no improvement by day five, you consider alternative therapies. And that was in the days where we had to wait 10 days or 15 days to get an Adams-TS13 level back. 
if we can get that level back in 24 hours and say that this is not TTP, this is not consistent with, with thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, it's appropriate to then consider initiation of eculizumab. This is why it's important for health systems to have a dose on hand to start therapy immediately. I have one patient who I, um, I talk about, and, and he's given me permission to, to discuss uh, some aspects of his case. Um, he was one of these patients that I came on to service uh, two days into his uh, stay. He was intubated in the ICU, and one of my colleagues uh, on a Friday night had started therapeutic plasma exchange sent off the Adams TS-13. When I walked onto the wards that morning, uh, the fellow was on the phone with the lab uh, in the Blood Center, Wisconsin, and had gotten the result that the Adams TS-13 level was 85%, and we started eculizumab that day. I have to say that it was quite intimidating because I was a brand new attending. It was, uh, I'd been here just a few months and I was ordering what is ostensibly the most expensive medication on the market and giving it to somebody. And I had a lot of help and backup and within 24 hours he was off the ventilator waking up. We're now several years later, he's doing completely fine. And this is a recurrent theme that we hear over and over again. He actually elected to stop his therapy um, and we monitor him very closely. Um, and if there's any concern about an inciting event, a bacterial infection, we're watching him and having him come in frequently. So the treatment I mentioned you can have response to plasma exchange in some people, even if they're not TTP. And so this is because you're giving back some of these complement regulatory proteins. So you can balance out complement for a little bit of time, but as soon as you try to stop therapy, you immediately relapse. Or depending on the degree of complement dysfunction, you end up having these issues where you, you respond to plasma exchange or you don't. We think about this complement-directed therapy like I mentioned, and I, I put up here our close coordination with nephrology. When I was trained as a fellow, as soon as we said that it wasn't TTP, it all of a sudden fell into the hands of the nephrologist. And, I, and um, we had a very great nephrology group where I was training, and they immediately took and run with these cases. And I think that handoff of where things are going and making sure that there's coordination is incredibly necessary because again, we get called because of the low blood counts. Our nephrology colleagues get called because of the kidney dysfunction, and it's recognizing that it's one thing that's causing all of it. So I, I shamelessly stole this from, from Mark Sloan at Boston Medical Center. This was off of his Twitter feed uh, last year. And this is, this is, I think, appropriate as we talk about Kaplan-Meier curves. We see them all the time but it's important to recognize that every time a Kaplan-Meier plot is dropping, somebody's had an event of interest. That event of interest may be that they had a relapse of, of, a, um, of a pneumonia or had recurrence of symptoms, but many times we're talking about relapse of a cancer, a disorder, or it is death. And what you're talking about is that these drops on these curves are people's loved ones. And so, um, Mark had this out there and it says each line whispers, we must do better. And so this is why we push so hard because these curves are not staying at 100%. So I just kind of brainstormed, how, how, how do I think we can do better? Well, as we've talked quite a bit today, is the earlier diagnosis, do we have effective screening tests? When is the modified ham test going to become available and what is the appropriate way of using it? This increased repertoire of therapy options, these modified complement inhibitors and new complement inhibitors. I think there's a lack of attention to quality of life measures in the research world. Um, so much was spent in the research realm of trying to improve therapy and to improve survival that once you survive it, that looks like a great number, but then you're living with the complications of treatment and therapy. The Oklahoma TTP registry has recently published work on depression and PTSD in patients who underwent treatment for TTP and found that there is a high rate of both of these disorders. 
there are probably, there's probably some aspect of it is the uncertainty of diagnosis, the severity of illness, and the length of time spent in the hospital, the fear of, of it coming back and what that means. But there's probably some level of um, neurocognitive effects of the disease that we're not appreciating and we're not completely understanding. And that's why these quality of life measures are gonna be important in ongoing trials. I talk about this being the most expensive drug that, that's out there on the market, and there are significant financial burdens. Um, I think CAR T-cell therapy just got announced this week as being $650,000 a year, so it may surpass eculizumab. Um, <coughs> but these financial burdens, and not just that, as Andrew and I were talking about earlier, um, just geographic burdens of getting to a center that has expertise, that needs to be assessed as well. Policies that are out there do not allow for adequate access to certain medications, and that's where I think advocacy of patients and providers is going to be important. As you're talking about finite resources in a system and uh, issues related to rare disease research in general, and healthcare provider education. So, so at, at this point, I'm, I'm gonna leave it with this. What are these other thoughts? So that other thoughts I was hoping to have people in the audience mention, how can we do better? We've done a lot of, of time up here talking about the, what we've done and what we've done to try to improve the system, and we've heard from individuals who are going through it every day, but I'd love to hear what some people's thoughts are on how we can do better for these to improve those Kaplan-Meier curves. So I'll leave it with that. Thank you. Nathan, thank you very much. Uh, certainly a different style. Um, having heard a lot of nephrologists talk, I, I could certainly tell just the, the pros, very cerebral. Uh, thank you so much for a, for a different perspective. Um, any questions at this point that uh, you'd like to offer to Dr. Connell? Kind of as we're, as we're waiting here for people to approach the, the microphone. Um, you know, a big, dichotomy that um, I, I was e even presented when I was a nephrology fellow is that TTP is neurologic and HUS is, is renal involvement. Do you think there's anything to be said about the microcirculation inside the brain as compared to, <coughs> as compared to the kidney as to um, why there is this prevalence of these manifestations the, in these two end organs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there, there certainly does seem to be differences in how the, the vascular endothelium responds, and um, we've, we've talked about it before with why is the kidney so sensitive to, to certain aspects of complement, um, but if you look at other organs, the, 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 cardiac, the myocardium also has uh, uh, issues with it. I think that there is, to some extent, the, um, the vascular endothelium of the, of the central nervous system as serving as a blood-brain barrier there's going to be dysregulation that occurs on its surface. And you're talking about very small vessels. People who have had prior strokes and then don't have any residual deficit from that stroke, they come in with diabetic crisis. Um, they, they end up with recurrence of their stroke, revisitation of their stroke symptoms. So I think that we don't give the, the CNS enough credit for how sensitive it is to these changes. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a great talk. I have a question. Um, maybe you can remind me. I just don't remember the, the paper uh, you cited about the modified ham test. The red cells that they use there, is that PNH red cells or regular normal red cells? Mm -hmm. uh, so here, I'll go back to it. So the, the paper is by, the, the first author is Gavr Gavriliki. Uh, Eleni Gavriliki, who was in Rob Brodsky's lab, and so this is June of 2015 in blood. Um, and so these, these cells are, are slightly modified, but it is essentially a PNH phenotype cell. So they are more sensitive to complement, mm -hmm. but not as sensitive as PNH cells, I guess, right? Correct. Because if it looks like serum from TTP patients, that's like normal serum with normal complement activity. So why is it then that it doesn't distinguish if you have received eculizumab in EHAS or if you're in remission in EHAS? Because apparently complement inhibition should control the complement. So why is it that 
uh, you see more death of these red cells in treated patients or patients in remission versus um, TTP patients? It's a great question. I think that goes to the point that complement is regulated at many levels. And so you end up having um, decreased, uh, decreased killing of these red cells, uh, but you have other mechanisms along that complement pathway that are going to end up leading to red cell lysis. Um, and I, I'll be honest with you, I don't know completely why it is that they have some sensitivity, but you, you would expect that there is some decrease in patients who are on eculizumab, but there is a clear difference between TTP patients and atypical HUS patients on, uh, on eculizumab therapy. Could one explanation be that these modified red cells are more sensitive to complement than endothelium cells? It's possible. more what's happening uh, by, in, in real life, you know, complement, uh, I mean, AHS is an endothelial injury before it's a red blood cell injury. Mm -hmm. And uh, what they designed is to have uh, uh, kind of activated endothelial cells on which you layer controlled sera versus uh, atypical AHS sera, and then you can measure the C5, B, C9, or what we call the membrane attack complex, layering over those endothelial cells. You know, should expect some layering or deposition of MAG in normal people, but definitely much higher level of MAG deposition in patients who have uh, atypical HS or complement-mediated uh, uh, TMA. And they can use it also to track response to therapy and then use it even to uh, you know, either space or even uh, stop the treatment and monitor if there's any increased activity of the complement of the therapy. And I think it's a much more uh, uh, physiologic, biologic, replicating what's happening in atypical HS patients as compared to the hand test. Mm -hmm. I'm not denying the yeah. importance of hand test, but I think an endothelial test would be more uh, uh, biologic. Yeah. That's, that's, those are great comments. Before you respond, there, I just wanted to reiterate for those people that may be listening to the recording or maybe in the back room didn't hear some of this discussion, we're, we're debating as to the, uh, the, the cell type that should be used in order to analyze um, somewhat in vivo or at least using um, uh, a, a patient's components, their blood or their serum, as to what is uh, going to provide the best sensitivity and specificity. Is, is it an erythrocyte or a type of erythrocyte or is it an endothelial cell? Yeah, I, 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 I agree with you because you're right. It's, it's at the endothelial layer that we're worried about. The, the red cells are an easy enough tissue to get and to, to have and to use with and work with in the lab, but the endothelial cells are a little bit more difficult. But it is, um, you want to have a test that's assessing what's happening in the actual physiology, replicating that as much as possible. Um, and so, if there is some evaluation between endothelials and, and, and red cells, you're going to see that it probably is that the endothelial tests are going to better mimic what happens in terms of outcomes. Great discussion. Thanks again. <laughs>